Hi, I'm James Zbor. I'm a PhD student at Oxford University, and today I'll be presenting A Tale of Sea and Sky, which is a paper that discusses the security of maritime VSAT communications. If you don't know much about maritime VSAT, you can essentially think of it as Internet for Boats. The acronym stands for Very Small Aperture Terminal, which is somewhat misleading, as these can be the size of an automobile and can cost quite a lot, but they enable ships at sea to connect to IP networks on land via satellite. And that leads to all kinds of interesting technology applications, ranging from letting you access your Instagram while you're on a cruise to sending critical weather updates to cargo ships as they pass near a storm. To some extent, maritime VSAT security is about protecting these underlying applications at the communications layer. There are four reasons that we think it was particularly interesting to look into this topic area. The first is that it's been historically understudied the high cost of equipment, some of these terminals cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's hard to get a new one for less than 50K, mean that it hasn't really been looked at much. And even if you find a terminal on eBay, because of the way that contracts are negotiated for actual service, you can't really do much other than look at the firmware on that device. However, we know in the abstract that attackers are likely seeking to harm these systems. Maritime has been historically a high value target for state and non-state adversaries as demonstrated by the NotPetya attacks against Maersk, for example. And this makes intuitive sense because the maritime industry has huge technology risk exposure. They've leaned heavily into automation. Some of the largest cargo vessels will carry almost a billion dollars in product with only 27 members on their crew because of the automation enabled by things like maritime VSAT services. Finally, we know that problems that we find in one VSAT service are likely more broadly generalizable. After all, a ship needs access to the internet, whether it's in Hong Kong or London, and so you expect standards in one area to be roughly consistent with standards in the other, such ships don't have to change service providers every time they move to a different part of the globe. The general process of VSAT is pretty straightforward. So imagine you're on a ship at sea and you want to visit Google.com. The first thing you'll do is point your dish at a satellite in geostationary orbit and send a request to it using a specific satellite protocol like GSE or return channel satellite to GBS. The satellite acts kind of as a bent pipe. It doesn't really sync or do much to the signal other than direct it to a ground station operated by your internet service provider somewhere on land. The internet service provider decapsulates this kind of esoteric satellite protocol, turns it into normal IP traffic, and sends it across the internet. When Google sends its response back, the process happens in reverse. Satellite beams the response up to, or the satellite ground station beams the response up to the satellite in orbit. Satellite in orbit beams it down on a big footprint to your boat. Now, it's important to understand how this downlink signal works because you want to have wide coverage area when you launch a satellite since they're expensive to put into orbit. As a result, these have huge signal footprints. So an eavesdropper located thousands of miles away will receive essentially the same signal as the one that you receive on your ship. And this is where the threat for attack comes in. They're looking at what an attacker can do if they listen to the signal on these massive geostationary orbit downlink footprints. One final thing to note about the VSAT architecture is that this process is not fast. It takes about 700 milliseconds to complete this whole process due to the fact that the satellites are far away, about 30,000 kilometers, and so speed of light delays mean that signals take time to propagate, which creates high latency in the network. This is important for understanding the security properties later. For our experiment, we wanted to study two satellites over Europe, which have roughly this geostationary footprint signal. So anyone within this red area, about 26 million square kilometers, could have their satellite signals intercepted by us at our ground station site in Europe. Our threat model was a low resource attacker. This is not someone who can afford a $50,000 VSAT terminal. Instead, we used simple home television equipment and tried to get as much data as we could out of the RF signal. To identify VSAT services, we pointed our satellite dish at satellites that we knew operated some degree of maritime VSAT service offering and identified all of the channels on these satellites. You can do this by looking at the KU band spectrum and these little humps in the graph represent channels that will be carrying traffic. However, not every single channel on a satellite will be maritime VSAT. We came up with a couple of heuristics in order to identify which streams were most likely relevant to our research. 
In particular, CSAT service is geared towards enterprise customers with access to expensive and sophisticated hardware who care about bandwidth. So as a result, it tends to prefer more modern revisions of standards and more complex modulation codes that would be overkill for simple satellite television or satellite radio services. Once we identified a feed, the real work of the paper began, which is trying to understand what data was inside it. We get to kind of cut over all of the detail here and just summarize it, um, but this is where the bulk of the work that went into this research was. So at the base layer, we found that the protocol used was something called DVD, Digital Video Broadcasting for Satellite, which is a generic streaming protocol that's used to send like satellite television signals and has been around for a fairly long time. One of the services DVD can provide is something called GSE, or Generic Stream Encapsulation, which is a protocol that's designed to send arbitrary packetized data across the DVD signal. Within the GSE stream, we identified IP traffic, which was the core of the VSAT services. It's important to note that IP packets can be split across these GSE fragments so that they don't necessarily all fit inside one GSE packet or one DVD baseband frame. To give a better idea of what this looks like, here's kind of the data that we started with. So I've censored out most of this information in case it contains sensitive data because it's a real world capture. But it essentially consisted of two DNS queries for domains ending in .in. You can see here that we've mapped the specific parts of this protocol stack to different bits of the hex dump. So that 42 byte there with the red arrow pointing to it is the start of a BB frame. It ends with a checksum way down at the bottom of the hex dump. Inside it, we can see a GSE fragment, and inside that fragment, we can see an IP payload, which contains those UDP packets. It's rare that you get such a coherent packet in a DVD-S feed, especially when you're using home television equipment. We often found that bytes were missing or whole chunks of IP payloads had just not shown up on our feed because our satellite hardware had simply missed it. And this was the real challenge. So we built a tool called GSE Extract, which walks back this protocol stack, but also tries to intelligently, forensically reconstruct IP packets with the information it has available to it. So for example, if an IP packet is split across multiple GSE frames and we're missing the middle portion, it will replace that middle portion with no bytes so you can read the packet in the tool like Wireshark. This allowed us to recover uh, 10 to 25% of traffic that would otherwise have been completely missed by simply listening to the recording, even if you didn't have even if you were able to parse the baseband frames perfectly. It's worth noting that GSE Extract is not simply a naive process of looking for IP packet headers and then treating the data after it as if it was part of an IP packet. This graph on the right kind of shows the difference between the two approaches. The naive decoder performs significantly worse as GSE packets become more fragmented, such as in the case of very large packets where IP payloads are split. However, GSE Extract performs consistently even with larger IP packets because it's able to intelligently identify where IP headers appear within the lossy data feed. Once we successfully extracted our data, the next big challenge is to understand what it means for maritime security. An initial glance shows that it looks an awful lot like any internet traffic. You see protocols like TLS and HTTP, uh, even people using BitTorrent over satellite. However, if we look at specific applications that kind of tie to the maritime industry or the satellite context, we get a better sense of the scale. And this is huge scale. So for example, we identified from unencrypted email protocols over 17,000 unique email addresses whose emails were being broadcast in clear text over this 26 million kilometer signal area. So what do we find in this data? What matters for maritime? It's important to think about whose data we were looking at because that tells us quite a lot of interesting information. We recognize more than 9,000 unique DSAT terminals, which doesn't translate exactly to 9,000 ships. You can have multiple terminals on a ship, but it does suggest that we're talking on a scale of thousands of distinct vessels. Some of these vessels belong to Fortune Global 500 companies. We identified at least three members, and we identified sensitive traffic belonging to at least six publicly traded companies with combined annual revenues of $700 billion. So these are some of the world's largest organizations who are essentially broadcasting their corporate LAN network in clear text over these vast geostationary satellite signals. In a maritime specific context, looking at shipping companies, we identified companies that together 
account for more than one-third of the global maritime shipping industry by market share. One of the challenges we had was how to tie IP addresses at sea to specific vessels. What we ended up doing, because we had a lot of data, almost 1.3 terabytes captured over a two-week span, is we developed a very simple fingerprinting mechanism for summarizing the characteristics of IP address, pulling out interesting strings from TLS certificates and DNS queries, and the first couple of packets to try to get basic, easily scalable information about ships. This worked pretty well. So we selected 100 random IP addresses and were able to successfully identify the specific vessels that owned 12 of them. Looking at the industries here, you can see a wide range of different purposes, including even a research outpost on a polar island that just couldn't get internet coverage without subscribing to VSAT services. Some of these fleets are very small, like a single fishing vessel, whereas others are enormous with hundreds of distinct cargo ships around the world. Looking at a specific maritime protocol gives you a sense of what the impact here is. So ECDIS or ECDIS means Electronic Chart Display and Information System, and you can think of it as GPS for boats. It replaces paper navigational charts with digital alternatives that can be regularly updated over a VSAT signal with regulatory changes like areas boats aren't allowed to go or critical safety notices. There are cryptographic protocols for keeping these integrous, but a lot of the ships that we observed didn't seem to be using them. And there are also many proprietary formats that didn't have these protections. Although you may be saying the attacker here is an eavesdropper, how could they possibly change navigational charts? Well, it turns out that the way navigational charts are updated isn't always all that secure. For example, we noticed that a lot of ships seem to just have an email inbox, something like ship name underscore chart updates at company.org, where chart updates will be sent via email by like every day. The captain will download them onto a flash drive, copy them over onto an access terminal, and use the new chart. An attacker who knows the correct email address could easily send spoofed emails with fake attachments for this purpose. We also noticed that many ships use simple FTP file share for getting the navigation updates. And since we're an eavesdropper, those credentials were in clear text and many of the FTP file shares were accessible over the open internet. Additionally, a lot of proprietary tools use unencrypted HTTP REST APIs to send updates to ships. And since the session tokens are sent in clear text, we can impersonate the ships and log into these APIs. From a general privacy perspective, things are also rather grim. For example, this graphic on the left shows um, personal identity information that was sent about the crew of a cargo ship, describing their passport numbers and date of birth and so forth to a port authority. This kind of data is handled routinely by cargo ships as they shift between jurisdictions. We also noticed a major ferry line was transmitting what appeared to be payment information in clear text from point of sale terminals. So whenever someone on the ferry would buy a soda, for example, something that looked an awful lot like a credit card number, although we weren't able to verify this, seemed to be sent in clear text over a coverage area of about 26 million square kilometers, along with various credentials and passwords and things that you would expect to see in a normal network. This is bad, but it may even be worse than you think if we can do more than just listen. And we came up with a way that an attacker could engage in active attacks in these networks which is to bring back TCP session hijacking. So we noticed that we receive the thin part of a TCP three-way handshake at essentially the same time as a ship at sea because we're essentially the same distance from the satellite even though we're on land. However, because we're on land, we have a much faster route back to the server that sent that thin request. And so the attacker can win the race and respond with a thin act response to the initiating requesting server faster than the satellite signal can due to the speed of light latency. And this allows for consistent TCP hijacking attacks over satellites. We replicated this by creating a fake web service running on a closed port of a real ship in the ocean, and we're able to impersonate that ship to our own web request. The suggested attackers might be able to do things like send false data back from vessels to back offices, or even just send TCP reset sequence numbers in order to cancel signals and functionally isolate the ship at sea. So obviously, this research has significant ethical implications, and we try to maintain the highest levels of ethical scrutiny in designing the experiment. We've never attempted to break encryption. We try to limit the data storage. We've elected not to name and shame organizations to keep a focus on the protocols rather than the companies. 
and the GSC extract tool will remain private in the short term while the industry has a chance to react to these issues. We also engaged a responsible disclosure, talking to both of the satellite operators and some of the largest organizations that were impacted. Generally, companies were pretty responsive. We were able to talk with CISOs of some of the world's largest organizations, and they seemed concerned about the issues, although it's unclear what substantive changes have been made, but at least they're aware. We also had a handful of organizations who were less happy. One organization threatened legal action if we published at S&P, but we're here today, and we think we, at this point, have communicated to them why it's important that people are aware of these issues and can make reasonable choices about the risk. So how can we make this better? What's stopping us from just using encryption? It's this long round trip time and this latency problem. ISPs are not simply lazy or careless, but hard technical limitations mean that encryption is non-trivial in this context. Satellite ISPs use something called TCP performance enhancing proxies, which essentially act as benevolent eavesdroppers on TCP connections and accelerate the TCP three-way handshake. Adding a VPN makes these tools no longer work. So you have full security but you literally decimate usability, often seeing a 90% reduction in performance. So what we need as a security community is to provide satellite-friendly encryption tools, ideally ones which don't require changes to the existing infrastructure and take into account these latency characteristics of the satellite connection. In sum, we've presented a new threat model in this paper. We've shown that anyone with access to inexpensive home television equipment can attack maritime VSAT services using a new attack approach by forensically reconstructing corrupted data to get usable information from incomplete RF recordings. We found that this has severe impacts for the security and privacy of many stakeholders within the maritime industry, and we suggested new steps towards protecting these critical services that the maritime industry can continue to benefit from the new technology offerings of these set services. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or ask during the information session. Thanks.